Now, just as people ask, how could the German people have allowed the rise of the Nazi party? I wanted to ask the question why the American people have acceded to what we might call the Patriot Act <laughs> regime. And I think there are a number of explanations for the, um, for the fact that we've allowed our government, and you know, I think the Canadian government to some extent, to wield so much dangerous power. So I want to give you five different kinds of explanations that I've come up with, and then I think it'll be interesting during the question and comment period to see what you think of these explanations, whether you question any of them or whether you have others. First, as I've already mentioned, a lot of what our government is doing, particularly in the surveillance area, has been secret. It's done behind closed doors, which means that the American people have no clear concept of the extent to which powers are being used. There's one um, Patriot Act enhanced surveillance technique called national security letters, where instead of going to a court, the FBI can issue its own demands for information from people who are custodians of all kinds of information. And um, this power has been used hundreds of thousands of times. But Congress put a gag order on the power so that anybody who receives a national security letter is prohibited from telling anybody ever, for the most part, that they ever received such a demand for information. Consequently, there is no public discussion about these demands. I'm going to tell you about one exception to what this, um, this whole gag regime. But basically, people don't really have a clear idea of what's happening behind the closed doors. So they don't really know the extent of the threat to our liberties, our privacy, and even our democracy. Second of all, I think people don't really have any clear idea of how much all of these enhanced powers affect ordinary Americans. When you talk to people about you know, these supersized anti-terrorism powers, people will say, well, terrorists shouldn't have rights. And they don't get the fact that this is not all being directed at terrorists. It's being based on, you know, directed at people who are either suspected of being terrorists or knowing something about terrorism or being somewhere along a path that might lead an investigator to find a terrorist. And so ordinary Americans, in fact, are affected, but they don't really realize it because they think it's not about them. Now, I was driving, we were driving through the streets of Montreal today, and as you, you, people have been mentioning, it's hard to avoid the fact that today there are you know, tens of thousands of people in Montreal exercising their rights and standing up for something that they all believe in. Now, it is pretty hard to get thousands of people to take to the streets to protest something that they don't think is about them or their friends or family. And I think that's one of the things that happens with this whole regime. People don't think it's about them. The third idea is I think that, and this is partly based on the fact that people don't think this is about them. People often say, well, I'm willing to trade some of my freedom for security. That's worth it. Now, I don't really mind if I have to take off my shoes at the airport. I don't really mind if we're giving up a little something, if in fact we're going to be safe. Now, I think partly people say that because they do secretly know that they're not the ones who are really going to be asked to make much of a sacrifice. The wages of the war on terror, the collateral damage, have fallen much more heavily on a particular group of people, mostly Arab and Muslim men. For the rest of us, what, it mean, what the war on terror means is sometimes we have to take off our shoes at the airport. But for Arab and Muslim men, you know, we're going to talk later about some of the stories of the much more extreme things that have happened and how it's pretty easy to try to, you know, to um, give up somebody else's liberty or somebody else's life in order for you to feel secure. Uh, number four, I think there's a very natural human reaction uh, to want to believe that the government knows how to keep <laughs> us safe. I live so close to the World Trade Center that for a month after 9-11, I could smell the smoke every time I walked out of my door. Now, people in New York who really had a, a sense of terror about what was happening, I think were particularly prone to believing the government when the government said, just trust us. You give us all the power. Let us act, you know, let us act in secret because we can't tell you what we're doing or the enemy might find out and that wouldn't be any good. And you have to just trust us. We are doing the things that need to be done to keep you safe. Well, yeah, it's hard to ask questions if you want to believe that the government is keeping you safe and you don't really want to ask too many questions because you don't want to really find out whether or not it's really not true. So one of the things that happened as I was writing my book is it actually became quite alarming because as I started to look at some of the things that our government was doing in the name of fighting terrorism, I started to have more and more questions about whether these things were even effective, whether they were cost effective, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of the costs of civil liberties erosion, privacy, etc. 
And some of them, I think, were even counterproductive. So there's a real question, again, you, it, it, you think that the government is doing effective things and don't even want to ask questions, you're much more likely to go along with whatever the government says is the right thing to do. Now, the worst explanation to me is number five. And this is a failure of empathy, uh, a failure to have any of Raoul Wallenberg in you. One night, uh, you know, not that long, I guess it was a few years back, I was sitting at a dinner party next to a woman who was a, a casual acquaintance. And knowing that I was president of the ACLU, she said to me, so tell me what the ACLU is doing lately. She said, but don't tell me about that Guantanamo stuff. She said, I'm so sick of hearing about all that. Why should I care about those people when they're not even American? Well, you know, I see the gasps all over the room. You know, I, I actually have answers to that. Raoul Wallenberg had answers to that. I think we can all answer that question. That's basic golden rule why you should care about locking people away in Guantanamo for years when there's no proof that they ever did anything on the theory that what if there are terrorists after all and I better, you know, better safe than sorry, Americans often say. I think that is a tremendous lack of empathy uh, and lack of morality. To me, it's really immoral to be willing to sacrifice other people's lives on such flimsy excuses just on the hope that the means are going to justify what you hope will be the ends. So yeah, that's a brief picture of the kinds of a uh, climate that I think allows the government to have all these uh, radically retrofitted powers to fight terrorism.